In this video, I'm talking to one of the most well-known and accomplished people in the live sound industry, Dave Ratt. Uh, he's worked with world-class touring bands, including the Red Hot Chili Peppers for over 25 years. He's the founder of Ratt Sound Systems and Sound Tools, in addition to his YouTube channel where I found him, where he offers sound and mixing tips as well as demonstrations that really help to intuitively understand audio concepts. Dave, thank you so much for your time. Uh, how are you and what have you been working on lately? All right, it's great to meet you, Kyle. And um, yeah, I'm doing all right. How am I doing is, how are you doing is kind of an odd question at this point in time, but- uh, Understandable. Per yeah. Personally good, family's good, and um, you know, challenges make us uh, stronger and uh, keep things interesting. So on that side, I guess I'm good too. You're a little bit diversified, right? You're not completely in the live event space. Uh, you're an inventor, an innovator with sound tools. Have you been working on anything in the off time? Has, has this allowed you to divert your efforts more toward that sort of thing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the diversification, though it's a small part of the overall picture, it's really, uh, I couldn't be happier that we have, um, yeah, the projects, you know, I'm kind of, hey, squirrel, I start something, I start something else. And uh, the rental industry is definitely under a lot of pressure. Um, and, you know, about 15 years ago, I started a sales and um, a sales division of RAT, which is doing well. And um, then we started an install division, which is doing, you know, it's staying busy. And um, started the manufacturing side of, uh, which is sound, manifested as sound tools mainly. But that's really kind of, for me, getting back to the core of why I got into this in the first place was to design, come up with an idea in my head and go through the process of making it real. Almost everything we make is, it, none of it's like dream scope stuff. It's all, uh, there's a problem. How can I, what can we create that makes this easier, faster, and better? A lot of it's driven from the rental side, but some of it's driven from just observation, years in the business. How can I take something that takes a lot of time and thousands of dollars worth of gear and make it into a $200 box that fits in your pocket? And then to manufacture that, make one is awesome. To make five and give them to friends is even more awesome or put them into the company inventory. And then it's just over the moon to like, you know, have these cool companies in Australia selling them. And, you know, we have a distribution network all over the world set up in Thailand and, and uh, it's just unbelievable. So that's been, that's always been my favorite thing. Getting back to the roots on that has been just wonderful. Yeah, I heard that um, in your beginnings, you had a mentor that really taught you how to fabricate um, speaker cabinets and things like that. And that's really your roots. I didn't understand. I didn't know live audio existed. I didn't even know how bands could even be. I'd listen to a record like, how do they know what to do? And how do they get there on the record? How do they, what are they doing? And then I found out there was recording studios and that was my only concept of it. I didn't think there was anything to do in live audio. Um, couldn't go to concerts too young. And um, so I started um, recording, uh, recording punk rock shows, going to uh, going to see punk bands at clubs and uh, bringing two mics and a cassette deck and um, giving the band a copy of the tape for getting me in free. And uh, then I was like, oh, I could do this. I bought a TAC four track, reel to reel, and I was recording this friend of a friend's band up in uh, El over in El Segundo, California. And this guy comes up from downstairs. He lives down below this house, recording studios, this guy's house. And he says, you want to see something really cool? And I was like, what do you got? And he go down in his living room. He's got four of these double 15 horn loaded <laughs> Gauss spins and these phase linear amplifiers and these giant horns that are two and a half feet wide. And he sets that up and he's got these, and he turns it up and it was like the voice of God has stepped on me with a giant foot. It was just, <laughs> in, in the word, yeah. you know, uh, once we did a show for Metallica, we did a bunch of shows for Metallica at the Troubadour. And at the time we brought in almost everything we owned. It was probably, um, God, it had to be late eighties. And uh, they came out and we stacked up the PA 13 feet high on either side of stage, hand stacked this thing, and Big Mick comes in 
And uh, he sound checks. He's kind of a little annoyed that he's getting a homemade PA in this local yeah. gig. And uh, he had a good time. I, I run into him years later, and in his awesome Scottish accent, he goes, "All oh, right, Dave Rack, amazing! The troubadour is like a starfish was stuck to my face. It was so loud." <laughs> And I never forgot that. And that was like how I felt when I first heard that. It was like a starfish yeah, stuck feeling. to my face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, he showed me that. And then he says, you know, I don't have any. I'm building a PA. I don't have any monitors. You want to help me build some monitors? So he taught me how to cut wood and cut everything up with a router and screwed and glued it together and built four wedges. I pitched in half. He got two. I got two. And now cool. I have my little two wedges fit in the back of my Toyota Celica. I do parties for 30 bucks and a case of beer. Nice. More about the beer than anything else, right? Yeah, yeah. The yeah. beer was definitely the good the driving force. For me, speaker design, cabinet design has always been really daunting. Um, have you had formal training or did you just sort of pick it up? You know, I, no, I haven't had any formal training. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely... I'm a, a straight-A student in college. I went for one semester, took two classes, and dropped out of digital electronics and calculus and never went back. I, and that's as far as I got. Learning, he taught me how to build speakers. It was trial and error. And there's actually, if you look up, um, if you do a Google search on Rat Sound Evolution, an old page on the old rat uh, site will come up and kind of show the mindset the thought of like first wedges and how we came up with the second and they sounded bad and basically we build it test it sounded find out the part we like keep those rebuild with a change yeah, is that it right there yeah there you go that's yeah. it so i'll put a link to this into the description for anybody who wants to check it out yeah that kind of goes through the mind the the thinking of um how we went from you know just starting out with just regular speakers and realizing that most people were doing horn-loaded stuff for live in order to get volume, then realizing horn-loaded sounded bad, then wondering why, why aren't concerts done with a bunch, studio monitors sounded good, yeah. concerts sounded bad, why don't they do concerts with a whole bunch of studio monitors? to stack them all up. And then you learn that they all interfere and the phasing. Yeah. But You have mentioned actually in some of your previous interviews that in the past it was trying to make a bad system sound good. Now we are in the age of having a stack of studio monitors, right? Yeah. Our acoustics, K2, K1 rigs. Um, they sound great, just don't make them sound bad. Um, what yeah, yeah, what yeah. was it that took us from that place to where we are now? The evolution, the, the power, the watts per rack space has been a huge stepping stone uh it's huge uh because you know like uh, dc 300s when i first started dc 300 was a viable amp and that was you know and eight ohms 150 watts per channel and to stereo 300 watts and four rack spaces or three rack spaces you know so you get 100 watts per rack space and now um you know you look at like these power soft X4s and they're 20,000 watts per rack space. So there's, it's like watts per rack space almost moves at the same pace as, um, as uh, memory for computers. So you can fit more in less space and so just the logistics of getting everything from place to place really yeah. allowed us to do that. Yeah, just having, I mean, before the most power you can get out of something required a massive amount of it. Uh, dead weight to get 500 watts. Now you get 500 watts out of something and you can hold in the palm of your hand. And then um, improved technology on speakers. The neodymium magnet has been uh, revolutionary for it. And um, as has the new adhesives that don't catch on fire <laughs> and bonding technologies to stop voice coils and thermal dissipation and uh, robotic manufacturing to keep voice coils aligned and precision. So there's been a lot of speaker, the speaker cones of today are absolutely amazing. Uh, the mechanics and electro, all of it is um, really allowed uh, a studio monitor type design, which is fairly inefficient with the speaker mounted on the baffle to get so much more volume out of that and have a good sounding thing get loud. Whereas before we had these smaller amps, lower power speakers, and we'd use big horns to gain efficiency. And 
the advantage of that is you could get a lot of volume out of not much power and a fairly uh, not a lot of speakers, but you with an acoustic uh, waveguide or acoustic horn, you don't get something for nothing. You never get something for nothing in audio. Um, so as you increase the efficiency, you reduce the bandwidth. So yeah. if you put a nice big horn on something, it's really loud over a narrow range. And if you don't put a, if you use something that's a uh, reflex, then you can get a lower volume over a wider range. I guess to envision it, and I haven't really, I don't know if I've covered this anywhere, to envision the difference between a bass reflex design, we have a speaker exposed to the air versus a horn loaded, you could envision like hanging a sheet in a room, uh, uh, just a sheet supported by the top, um, just dangling there. And if you wanted to uh, create a representation of a studio monitor or a speaker mounted on the baffle, you take your hand and punch it. And that's the amount. And you can imagine, you kind of visualize that. You see a small part of the sheet pushing forward and the rest of it not moving very much, you know, if you just hit it an inch or so. Uh, a horn, you would take a cone, a big paper or cardboard cone, and attach it to your hand and then hit it. And you could see that you could move a lot more of the sheet with the cone than you could with just your hand. On the other hand, if the cone was really big, it'd be hard to move that cone really fast. Yeah, and I see. You'd yeah. And you wouldn't be able to go pop, 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 pop. You'd have to go pop, pop, and as it got bigger and heavier. So the cone, that would limit your high frequency response, but you'd move more air um, and you'd lose some of the articulation. So horns kind of act like acoustic transformers. They help the motion get commu connected to the air better, but the more efficiently you connect it, the narrower the bandwidth you lose low frequency determined by the size of the mouth of the horn and you lose high frequency because the it's not amplified the same as the low frequency very interesting for that size horn yeah especially the way you explain it and that's kind of transitions me to your youtube channel that's what really i mean honestly you're the inspiration for me starting my youtube channel well that's Wait, really cool thank you definitely and on my channel i strive to create these demonstrations um, can you talk about that? Is that how you've always seen audio? Do you have a similar passion for it in that way? Um, yeah, I think not just audio in life. You know, I think it's a uh, uh, double-edged sword. You know, in school, I wasn't, I had a hard time in school. They'd talk about concepts. And unless I could really visualize or understand what they were talking about, they just kind of said, this happens because of this. Unless I understood the because of, I couldn't remember it. I couldn't retain it. So I always needed to dig, dig deeper and create a mental image of what's occurring, which caused me to learn very slowly and kind of get frustrated with stuff. On the other hand, that uh, the stuff I did learn, I would learn very well and I'd build up these building blocks and be able to understand more. And then I'd have to test to see if they were correct. So it helped me stump that in combination with I worked at Hughes Aircraft for a while in the environmental test lab where we were testing military hardware for various environments. And again, I learned to, you know, test something, check what you intuitively think, and then what happens sometimes align, sometimes they don't, but it's wonderful to test it and figure it out. I think I've done a pretty good job of envisioning sound in my head, in my head of like uh, picturing um, the way sound interacts and finding parallels in other things in life, you know, like waves and water. You can say, when I surf, I can see a south swell come in, I can see a north swell come in, and I can see that they overlap each other and yet they don't interfere with each other until they're breaking. Um, and sound waves are similar from multiple sources. Yeah, I completely connect with you on that, um, seeing the things you know about sound and applying that to different things in life. And that's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that a lot of the people watching right now are, are interested in that. And I want you to talk on, you know, I think that for me, learning every little way to do every um, little task on every piece of equipment is futile, right? Because you're not going to be on that piece of equipment every day unless you have a really cush um, touring gig. Mm -hmm. um, but I think learning the basics, understanding how it looks, understanding things intuitively really allows you to walk up to any situation. 
And do you feel like that's been the case for you in both adapting to situations and making innovative products throughout the years? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, having a um, having those fundamental building blocks. I mean, the one that I'm focusing on now, maybe the next video or one of the videos I'm going to do coming up has to do with supplying phantom power from front of house and monitors simultaneously. And there's a lot of um, chatter or, or questions about or mis misperceptions that um, if you supply 48 volts from front of house and you supply it from monitors, there's a rumor started that that would blow up your microphone. So it'll put 96 volts or something. It would, and it's just not true. Having understanding enough about electricity to know that if you put two voltage sources in parallel, that the voltage stays the same and it doubles the current. And since the mic is in charge of how much current it draws, it won't hurt the mic. It's just so a backup. Set up yeah. a, I'll set up a, yeah, it's redundancy rather than damage. Um, so being able to have someone say, hey, if you put two phantom sources, I never thought of it. Two phantom sources, it'll burn up a mic. It's like, no, it won't. Let me go check it out. Okay. No, it doesn't. Here, let me show you this. So we'll, we'll, um, uh, having those fundamental building blocks will help you get farther than rote mem memorization. I feel for everybody in the live sound industry who was relying on a paycheck and now it's gone. But I also feel for the people who just graduated from school or just it's about time for them to get an internship at a live sound house and there aren't any, right? Um, right now might be a good time for those people to start putting the real world experience on hold, but starting to sharpen those understandings of how sound works. How can they do that? How can somebody who wants to be successful in live sound start when live sound is at a standstill right now? Um, you know, that's a great question and um, something that um, if new everyone faces in the industry right now. First of all, there's a lot of audio jobs available. Radio, podcast, audio, um, anything having to do with uh, meetings. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of non-live reinforcement audio uh, opportunity out there. In addition, this is the time to go to school. This is like all the live industry people are forced to go to audio college, not forced to. We have the opportunity to go to all audio colleges and create those audio colleges through YouTube and podcasts and reading and Google searches or whatever it takes to bump up our skill set and expand it. And, you know, maybe someone that's just a live engineer up to now will master Pro Tools or master video editing. And knowing video editing is useful because then you know what they're looking for for audio. With any challenge, there's an opportunity. And I think the people that are going to be most successful in whatever they do are the ones that focus on the opportunity rather than the detriments of the challenge. Yeah, if you see it as exciting, then, then it'll probably work out for you. Let's take Dave Ratt, the owner of, or the founder of Ratt Sound Systems. What kind of experience would you respect seeing for new guys entering as entry level employees for your company? That's a great question. And that's been, like many things, something that's morphed over time. You know, it's a developing uh, perception or developing um, idea for us. And it used to be, you know, as someone who started the company, was looking for other people that had these vast skill sets, somebody who could load a truck and wire the boxes and wire the racks and mix the show and trying to look for these Swiss Army Knife humans, um, and over time, just through experience and logic, kind of learned that those people tend to be, that the, there's a specialist. You know, when you first work a club, you're, you go in, you set up the monitors, you set up the mics, you go up front, you dial in the wedges, you dial in the house, you're stage manager, front of house, monitor engineer, and stage tech all in one. Maybe you do lights on the side. Each of those tasks on the upper levels has turned not only into a separate human, but then it turns into a whole department and a whole truck. So every small task expands out. Um, that's awesome. Uh, you know, and then that can't, you know, you then like looking at like the space shuttle, no hu one human could actually build the space shuttle. It's a whole department of every one person. Just the magnitude of that is fascinating.
So taking that concept into action, making that actionable, as we, over time, began building our crews and hiring people uh, more like an Ocean's Eleven, Ocean's, like a, like a, like a robbery movie. Yeah. <laughs> where you've got maybe you've got somebody who's nothing but muscle and you've got and just wants to load the damn truck yeah. and get that stuff in and out and you got another person that's all smarts that wants to come in and figures out everything fixes everything that's broken doesn't do so good in the truck but might help a bit if need be and then you've got someone who's a people person who gets along with the, the band the production manager who's the natural moderator um, and you know, so trying to put these crews together that have a diverse skill set, but a little bit of knowledge everywhere else. And that's where this opportunity comes. We can still have our dreams and desires of what we want to master, but having these foundational skill sets everywhere else. So you do want to be a bit of a Swiss Army knife, but you also can really specialize as well. Uh, so putting these uh, multifaceted crews together not only applies to skill sets, but it applies to race and gender and scholastic backgrounds. So, you know, having somebody who's gone to college and people, there is no, you wanna have as diverse a group as possible if you really wanna have all your bases covered and have an optimal team. Yeah, and it's, it, whereas before, like you said, it'd be like four guys trying to do the whole operation. Um, now it's maybe four guys in the audio department and four more in the lighting department. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if- And then you have four on stage. <laughs> then right. you have three yeah. more out front. <laughs> yeah. So those things are expanding. Um, getting back to the question of, you know, how, how can you get experience that's applicable to that specialty right now when there are no opportunities? That's just a question I guess no one can really answer right now and only time will tell, huh? Um, yeah, how can you get those skills? I think that um, a lot of stuff, like doing YouTube videos, doing these tests and these demos, uh, another demo that I'm going to do coming up that I have on the slate that I haven't figured out how to do quite yet, but I've got a good idea, is a desktop subarray demo where I'm actually going to set up tiny little subwoofers and show the cardioid pattern and the, and have two multiple mics say, this is what cardioid, and this is where the cancellation is, this is what end fire works, this is dispersion differences, and see if I can translate that from a desktop um, and carry over some of the stuff that I've learned on the larger scale. Yeah. Um, I think taking that same concept now, there's no reason, or switching to another version of that, um, back in, I think it was 2006, um, Chili Peppers management came to me and said, hey, we want to do something special with the sound. And I came up with a couple ideas. And one of them was that um, I could run two PAs or multiple PAs on each side and have one dedicated for vocals on each side, stereo vocal PA and stereo instrument PA. Um, I overlaid that with another concept where I could have the ability to make the, to widen the platform. So I could have the whole mix on the inside PA and then go wide to the outside, or I could put effects outside. So having things move between them. And I was like, I wasn't sure which was gonna work and I wasn't sure whether they'd buy into it, but they were putting pressure on me to come up with something. So I went and bought three little $100 home stereo, uh, I forget, I forget cost made them. There was just three little speakers, it looked like a little clear line array. And I put, and I got the Pro Tools guy from the band to come out to the house and we set up a Pro Tools rig and I did the little, I set up a mix on the Pro Tools and mixed to those little PAs. And I put the vocal in one set wow. of home stereo speakers and the guitars in another. And I had three sets per side, three stereo sets. And I learned that three sets wasn't much better than two, but two was way better than one. And that's how you sold the concept of the double hung PA in the beginning well, I, then, huh? I got all ready to do it. I was like, okay, this works. And not only that, I figured out, and I checked IM distortion issues, and I was able to replicate a lot of the concepts in my living room. So then I packed this thing all up, put it in a suitcase, called the manager and said, okay, I'm flying out to New York, I'm gonna demo it. And he said, nah, 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 whatever you wanna do is fine. So I never got to demo the rig, but I was able to 
show the concept, not unlike what I did with the pink noise generators in a living room setting. So I think just because we don't have giant hardware at our disposal, we can download almost any digital console into our laptop. We can, there's inexpensive mixing software. We can get small PAs, we can download, we can get, we have access to different mixes. It's not that hard to download. There's plenty of freeware, multi-track freeware. We can practice mixing. We can practice using compressors and uh, doing that on headphones and small PAs and looking at phase problems. So, and I also try and do all my videos that way. I do almost, I try and do everything that with equipment that can be bought off eBay for under $500 or under $1,000, which may be a lot of money to some, but some of it can be scaled down. I use old, easily accessible gear to do all the demos so they can all be repeated. And that's a good point because honestly, if you're just starting out, you're not going to be behind the mixing console with a line array, you know, and, and a sub array that's all top of the line. Um, sit, spend your time practicing in your living room. Hey, right now, you're always in your living room. So mm -hmm. the sound apply, the, the laws of sound apply just as much in your living room as they do at that festival stage. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, that's a great point. And scaling up, just knowing that if you have a cancellation, if you take a small speaker and you hang it from a string from your ceiling two feet off the ground, and you get your smart out, and you see that you have a reflection happening at 800 or 1200, 800 cycles, and you get big cancellations, well, if it's 20 feet off the ground, that's going to be an 80 cycle issue. You can scale that stuff up and scale it down. Uh, distance versus frequency, it's, it is somewhat linear. Uh, so learning the math there, you can actually build miniature things that work. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm excited to see um, on your YouTube channel, you've sort of teased that you've been 3D printing little tiny micro wedges. You just mentioned that you've got the subwoofers. Um, really check out Dave's YouTube channel, it's really cool. He even sets up uh, little audiences and, and puts a little mic at, you know, mix position and it's all in the vicinity of his desktop and he really makes these points obvious. So you do a great job of that stuff. Well, thank you. Yeah, people should go out and replicate it. Go try it. Don't just believe me. I, I pretty much, I'm showing you not the way to do things. I'm showing you examples of things that function, but you know, you can set this stuff up and do it yourself and find flaws to what I'm doing or additions to it or just get a good mental grasp of what's going on. You've seen hundreds, thousands of front of house engineers, of system techs, from probably the beginning of their career to the middle of their career. Um, yeah. What are some of the most common mistakes those people are making? What are some of the indicators of success that you see in those people? The early mistakes, the early uh, stumbling blocks that some engineers never escape from is almost identical to the stumbling blocks that some people never escape from um, of someone learning to drive a car. And you don't necessarily need to escape from them, but when someone, you know, that is excited about driving, um, really into cars, when they get their first car, you're riding with the 16 year old dude, every screen light is the beginning of the race. <laughs> and every red light yeah. is a screeching stop, right? It's just how fast can I go? Every opportunity to step on the gas. Well, that's pretty much the young sound. I, would, I don't want to be just not everyone, but there's definitely a group where it's the excitement of the kick drum is the excitement of the gas pedal. And okay. early young engineers, you can tell them because the kick, it's, it's basically a, a kick drum with filler instruments around it and some vocals yeah. hidden back in the back there. And then the other inexperience is inconsistency with uh, a young engineer will definitely not have, every show will sound different. So getting the mix in balance is one thing and getting the mix consistent another. So an experienced, a world-class engineer will have those two things mastered. They'll have the mix in balance, Determining what balance is, it, different for every band, or different for many, many factors, and, but having it in balance for that 
scenario, that situation, that application. And the other is that they'll have consistency, worldwide consistency. No matter where you put this engineer, um, he can or she can make that band sound very similar and grab the specific sound they're looking for for that album or for that song. Along with that, it's like somebody learn drinking for the first time too you know you get someone who's early on they drink they drink way too much and they get a huge hangover and they screw everything up that's like a you know again young inexperienced and maybe the experienced engineer is like or the experience yeah experienced sound human is um it's okay that kick drum power may be there in the system and that bass energy and that volume may be there but they don't have to have it turned on all the time in your face. They might give you a little taste of it right at the beginning of the show. And then the song, a certain song might come in, they give you another taste of something else. And then later on in the show, they give you a bit more. And then for the encore, they give it all to you. So you got this build up. It's like a good book where you, you lay the stage and then you build it up to a, a crescendo or a culmination. Um, having that patience and that foresight to look through the entire show and build a volume strategy, a frequency strategy, um, and anticipation, being able to do that with respect to sound limits, with respect to the age of the audience, the type of artist that you're working for, the desires of the management, the desires of the band, and your personal preference, triangulating all that into a consistent mix. That's where the real experience is. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that you're dead on with the car example, because honestly, you don't have control of that car in the beginning. It's like, you know, a stop sign. Okay, we're on yeah. the highway now. I got to get there. And in my experience, that's how mixing my first few shows was, especially in the 15 minute changeover, 15 minute sound check situation that you're in in the beginning, right? Um, you're just trying to put fires out, essentially. Like, mm -hmm. what is that something feeding back? You know, that, that bass sounds terrible. And so you're not really thinking long term through the set you're just thinking right now i've got to get this to sound okay over time right, right. you can get it to sound okay not only that but you can plan ahead and hold something back you don't have to make it as yeah. good as you can right now that's the key is to be able yeah. to have so much do you have enough experience to plan ahead and as a young engineer learning that as early as possible learning that um how much energy do I have available? How much gas do I have in my car? How much power is available? How am I going to use it to, to you know, go, drive down a, a residential street? Or am I going to wait until I got to pass a car or somebody, you know, I get on the freeway? What, using things in the right place and time is um, wise and helpful. Okay, so some people are, are sure that they want to be front of house engineers. Um, some people are sure that they want to be system techs. They don't want to mess with the mixing. Mm -hmm. um, for those who are not sure yet, uh, what's a good place for them to start? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's really interesting. Um, you know, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I didn't want it. I never wanted to be a front of house human, but um, uh, I enjoy it. Uh, I also enjoy doing monitors, and that's more of a challenge. I think if we were going to come up with just a litmus test, if I wanted to ask, if in five minutes I was going to determine whether you're a front of house monitor engineer or, or, or system tech, let me think about it. The first thing I would do is get, say, give you a task of three things and then yell at you for doing two of them wrong. And if you focused on the one you did right and you were, were fixing the other two, you're a good monitor engineer. If... Um, if uh, all of that traumatizes you, if I told you that no matter how good of a job you do, you will never get it right and someone's still going to hate you, but you might have fun doing it, you might be a good front of house engineer because yeah. you're never going to make everyone happy. Um, if I don't give you any feedback at all and you just do your thing and I don't say anything, it, I don't give you any comment up or down, that's more front of house. If you'd rather be told, yes, that's good, or no, that's bad, you, more monitors, you know, because you want that direct communication. You need someone to, um, you know, tell you where you're at. You don't have this constant flow of uh, self-worth, regardless of what people say. And if you need things, if you have the desire or a desire, strong desire to be able to do things right, 
and master them, get them perfect every time, and actually accomplish it, you're probably gonna be a better tech. If you're okay knowing that no matter how many battles you win, you will always lose the war. You will always, front of house, no matter how perfect you mix, you will never get to album quality. The room will always take you out. There's always something wrong. Whereas you can wire a stage perfectly. You can have every channel working. You can have everything in the right spot and functioning. And you've done your job. If the room sucks, that's not your problem. You can tune it as best you can, but that's not, you can slough that on someone else. The front of house engineer has to do the best with something that's unsolvable. They can only be dealt with pretty well. And a monitor engineer has just got that much more dynamic thing where you can have a shit show or a great show and not necessarily in control, but very personality re related. So I think those dynamics, I didn't necessarily explain it as clearly and I'll put more thought into it, but. No, I, I think the, it made sense. Yeah it's, yeah, it's how are those, you satisfied by your work, right? Yeah, what, what, what are you looking for as far as satisfaction? Do you need a, hey, you did it perfect, nailed it. A tech is good or a monitor engineer good. Okay, you totally s screwed this up. Are you gonna argue that point because you did it right? you're never gonna make it as a monitor engineer. You might make it as a tech, because a tech is, you did do it right, and you can argue the point. The monitor engineer, there's no sense arguing it. You did it wrong because they feel you did it wrong, not because you actually did it wrong. Yeah, a monitor engineer's gotta have 50% emotion, 50% reality, and uh, a technical 100% reality, and a front of house engineer has to be pretty much sure of themselves whether they do it right <laughs> or wrong, and just, it's a big smushy world. Yeah, and which one are you? I'm a bit of all of them in some ways. Um, I don't like getting yelled at by the band, but um, I'm okay with it, you know? I just, the front of house thing, I like the front of house. I actually like front of house. I like things that are unsolvable. I like the fact that there is no correct solution. I like complex situations with overlapping interactive variables and finding the optimum trajectory through that maze, even though there is no correct trajectory through that maze. One thing I heard you say that was really um, interesting to me was that that takes a big load off, you know? The problems that are impossible to fix will not be fixed, but we're gonna do everything we can to fix the problems we can. Don't worry about the and things so, beyond your control. Yeah, figure, out what your program, figure out your scope of your actions, what it contains, and then optimize it. You've toured with some world-class bands, like I said at the beginning. Um, Red Hot Chili Peppers is one of the most notable, but Blink-182, Rage Against the Machine, uh, Sonic Youth, all of these bands. What are some of the coolest stories that you've got? Like, what's one of your fondest memories where you just thought, wow, I'm really blessed to be um, where I am? You know, they, all the tours are different. Doing the Soundgarden reunion tour was unbelievably great it was just so good it was just so good it was just because I, I had known them since um the very first tour we did rat sound did in that wasn't black flag was um danzig and soundgarden in 1990 89 or wow. 90 and um you know, I like met those guys, and then I worked with them again on Lollapalooza in 92, and Chili Peppers headline in Soundgarden was on the bill. And then fast forward to the reunion tour, and I got to mix them. First time I ever mixed them after knowing them for so long. So it was just like a, a all many good things converging together. Just such an awesome band. Um, so probably one of the most heartwarming Chili Peppers, I worked for 27 years-ish, 26 years, I don't know, a lot of a long time, so there's so many there. Blink was probably the f most fun tour, one of the most fun tours. They were just delightful. You know, I would run around and I'd get the, they would get set up, they would, uh, I didn't need to mix a lot. Once I got the mix together, it was just held. So I would go down and listen in the audience and they, you know, I'd sit there and Tom would look out and see me standing in the audience, and he'd look over at Mark, and he'd be like, you know, and then Mark would see me, and they'd both be looking at me, and I'd be, I see them looking at me, because I'm listening, I was like, oh shit. So I, so I ducked down into the audience, and then I'd run really low, 
and pop up somewhere else. And, oh, they, and then they'd see me pop up, right? And they'd try and like head nod me back to the mix board, you know, just, and they'd both be looking at each other, like get back there. And so we would kind of play hide and go seek. That was fun. Uh, offspring, Dexter used to, um, when they went, I worked with them from clubs to arenas. So on the later end of their club tours, right before they went to arenas, they were doing these sold out clubs. He would stop in the middle of the show and go, you know, I think our sound man looks really thirsty. Are you thirsty? I'd pick a bike and go, yeah, yeah, I'm really thirsty. I'm thirsty. And um, he'd say, you know, here, I'm gonna drink a sip of beer. Here's a cup. You guys take a sip, but pass it back to him, right? So they'd make it up, two, uh, one, two back would be gone. And he'd do that a couple times. He'd say, okay, I think our sound, I, if you're gonna do something, you gotta do it right. He says, all right. He, I'm gonna lay, and he'd lay on the audience with a beer in his hand and have the audience pass him all the way back. And I'd climb up and stand on the meter bridge of the console with the mic, uh, with the talkback mic waiting for him. And then he'd make it, they'd pass him all the way back and he'd climb up on the meter bridge and I'd hand him the mic, he goes, all right, here we are. And they'd give me a beer and I'd drink the beer and he'd go, nice. okay, cool, I <laughs> think, all right, I'm going back, let's get the show on, right? And he'd lay back on the audience and he'd go back out. That's awesome. And finish the show. Man, so it's like the personal connections. I mean, that's what really highlight the highlights of your career. And I think that probably says something about why you were so successful, right? It's not just being an asshole who can mix really well. It's being somebody who is personable. Getting along with the bands, getting, you know, just really being open and honest is important. Uh, not blaming other people when something goes wrong. If it's my fault, I was like, oh, yeah, I screwed that up. Um, if they'd hire me, I'd go to the rehearsals and just sit there. I'd just sit there, hey, can I hang out? I'm just going to hang out and sit, and I'd go wander around. If I'm, while you're rehearsing, I'm just going to listen to stuff. I walk and stand in front of the guitar rig, stand the bass. I just listen to the stage and try and learn what they want to sound like. If you, as a sound engineer, can go to a rehearsal with a band and help them get their rehearsal volumes correct if you can help to get their rigs dialed so that they sound the way they want to sound and everybody can hear each other you're going to develop trust and you say oh now you you know what they want to sound like then i'll say when i do a show for you i'm going to do the same thing i did for you here and some of the foundations of that is like standing in the middle where they go to the standard four-piece rock band standing in where the singer would stand if they do stand in the middle and getting the bass to be the same volume or similar volume to the guitar, similar volume to the drums. If somebody's overly loud, um, not guitar and bass rigs aren't like mixing boards where if the guitar is too loud, you just turn it down. You turn down the guitar, all of a sudden it feeds back properly to the song. There's all kinds of other dynamics. We don't want to, I choose not to mess with that. With Soundgarden, I just, I asked, I said, well, I went to rehearsals and they played and I wandered around and uh, Chris was like, you know, I can't hear my vocal. I, everything's too loud. I said, okay. And I went to um, Kim. I said, uh, can we move? Um, is it okay? He goes, what's wrong? You want me to turn down? I said, no. I just, I want to point your guitar rig out a little bit just so it doesn't point to the center. I want you to keep your volume. I don't want to mess with what you're doing. And I went to Ben. I said, okay, I want to move your bass rig. He's like, Turn down and said, no, just want to move your bass rig out. And I got with it. I said, okay. And we just kept, I just moved stuff physically until I got the sound balanced in the middle of the stage. And it looked all walk. He said, what are we going to do with show? I said, don't worry about that. Right now, we're just getting your sound balanced. We're getting everybody happy. You guys are getting your tones together. We're getting everybody happy. And also, you know, a reunion, you got to get these guys. I got to make sure I don't create any new conflicts. They're healing themselves already. Um, at some point, farther in rehearsals, you know, Ben came up to me and said, hey, if I turn down, can I move my bass rig closer? Yeah, of course you can, but don't mess your sound up. I need you to have your sound so you're comfortable on stage. You play well, I'll do well. And they kind of acclimated, and then they started wandering to the center of stage and listening to their rig versus the other rigs. And the tech started doing that too, and everybody started getting on the same page. They had a reference point to shoot for. Um, that not only made my job easier mixing them live but it helps with building trust and a bond with the band and that they understand that we're all on the same page you're not just going to crank their sound. you don't disregard their music by turning down their rigs yet you're paying attention to everybody and finding that 
personal dynamic and you know getting a job if you're a sound engineer that's trying to work your way up in the industry and there's a band down the street or somebody rehearsing you know it's like can i hang out can i help you with sound can i tune things can i help you can i fix the cables can i solder you give where are your bad cables fix all the bad cables where <laughs> make sure all the rigs are in polarity i don't know figure that all out and um working gigs for free working gigs for cheap hauling paint whatever it is helping transition that rehearsal sound into the live environment. So when they're on stage, they know that the audience is hearing the image they wish to present is a valuable asset and they're gonna want you around. And if they want you around, that's kind of your path to success. Wow, really well said. Dave, thank you so much. I'm glad I reached out and I'm glad that you were willing to do this, so thank you. Well, my pleasure and my honor. It's all good. Yeah. And um, yeah, um, it's great you're doing this, sharing knowledge. And, the, you know, just uh, it's what we need. Everybody needs to kind of get together and share ideas, to bump it up a notch. Well, I appreciate what you're doing. I'll continue sending people your way. And um, I hope to see more coming out of your YouTube channel and your other projects. All right, Kyle. Great to meet you. And hello, everyone. Rock it up. <laughs>